This is Road to the Golden Door, where we unpack the proven success formula straight from the minds of Golden Door winners, uncovering the motivation, methods, and the mindset it takes to become an elite performer in door-to-door -door sales and in life. This is Road to the Golden Door. Now, here's your host, Mikey Lucas. What's up? Welcome back. Road to the Golden Door podcast. I got a special guest here, my boy Cutler Webster. How you doing today, brother? Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I'm doing good, Mikey. Appreciate you having me on today. Yeah, of course. Looking forward to it, man. I, uh, I've been following your journey, man. I know uh, one of your good friends, Dallin, uh, really good dude. And uh, actually, uh, I actually spent some time with Dallin Green about two years ago. Knocked doors with Dallin. I got some recordings of Dallin. Um, Really excited to be able to, uh, to 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 jam with his prodigy, and uh, looking forward to to understanding how does how does how does one hit one thousand and twenty seven accounts? So for everybody that doesn't know who Cutler is, um, who is Cutler Webster? So yeah, my name is Cutler Webster. I uh, went out this summer. I uh, got a golden door. I serviced a thousand and twenty seven accounts. Had a six hundred twenty dollar CV, which equated to six hundred fifty one k in in revenue. Yeah, born and raised in good old Ogden, Utah. Company that I sell for, headquartered there. Been there, just finished my third summer, and it's uh, it's been a good, it's been a good ride so far. Oh yeah. So you're with Hawks right now. Did pass. Why? Uh, what, how did? You, well, tell me the journey. Getting. How did you get recruited in? What does it? What's that look like? Yeah. So it's actually a funny story. So. Yeah, I got home. I served a, an LDS service mission for my church. Got home, you know, yeah. got full time into started going to college, you know, full time and just working, you know, normal, you know, nine to five job, you know, pay my way through school type thing. Um, yeah, so I one of the one of my so I had a really good friend, childhood friend growing up and we were at a church activity together. And um, you guys probably know his name. He's got a pretty big name in the door to door space. His name's Parker Langeveld. I'm not sure if you know him, but he was yeah. actually yeah, so he was a really good friend. He well, he's cousins with one of my really good childhood friends growing up, and we were at a church activity together. And I met him there. And then he hit me up like two days later. You know, took me out to you know the lunch, gave me his spill, and I actually ended up saying no. I actually didn't go out and do it my first summer. I was you know just no college. I'm gonna go to college. You know, you know, work my little you know construction job in the summer. You know, make you know at the time I thought it was good money. You know, pay for school, and I'm gonna do that. And then so I turned down the opportunity. Um, then I had a friend, another friend who went out and did it and he, you know, made, you know, like twice as much money as I did in the same amount of time. So I was like, well, dang, like if this guy could do it, like no reason I couldn't do it. So I actually just showed up at the office one night and just said, Hey, like I'll, I'll do it. And then I just went all in. So you're a, uh, you're a Parker, you're a Parker recruit. <laughs> yeah. Let's go, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Parker is a, uh, is a beast, man. Love him or hate him, that kid is, that kid's results are are second to none. I, yeah. I mean, I, the kid can sell anything. Yeah, he gets he gets stuff done for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, he's intense. Yeah. So tell me about this year, bro. So you got you got you hit your golden door. What did you hit the prior year? Is this was this your first summer or no? Yeah. So I've been in door door for three years. This past summer was my first summer getting a golden door. The year, the summer prior to me getting in Golden Door, I sold like 510 accounts, which equated to 330K in revenue. So you doubled year over year. Nope. So let's talk about that. Tell me, tell me, how'd you do that? Like, what's, what's the secret? Yeah. So I think, yeah. I don't Did think you work, was it, was it more time? Like, cause you gotta think about it like this, Keller. Okay, when people hear that, they go, yeah, because there's this false narrative out there that people think, oh, I'm going to double my sales. I'm going to go and do that. Like someone that goes from a golden door to a double golden door in solar, 130 to 260, right? Or like, you know, 60 to 120 in a year. I mean, that is that is complicated to do. You went from 500 to 1,027, 510 to 1,027 in uh, in one time frame. Um it's a, it's cliche, I think you could say, but like we, we, we always talk like, Oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to go 10 X my, uh, 10 X my efforts or whatever yeah. results. And 
you know, so tell me what I get. Yeah. What's the secret, dude? Like, you know, I'm sure you get that asked by the guys in your office all the time. So what's the, what, what does Cutler say the secret is? And then I'll obviously dive into that more. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I don't think there's necessarily just one thing that I could contribute to the fact that I was able to double my revenue. I think it was a combination of a very few simple things. Um, so number one, it, it really was work ethic. I mean, I'm a firm believer just to say like it is, I think in this space, especially door to door, like there's a lot of people that talk a good talk, right? But when it comes down to walking the walk, I think a lot of people falter just to, you know, say like it is. And so, and I do believe that there's a lot of people who are very talented and I have very good salesmanship, but they do not have the work ethic to, to put up those big numbers. So for me, it's like, I looked at, I looked at the work ethic and the time on the doors as, as half of the equation to get to where I wanted to go. So I knew that. And when I say like work harder and longer hours, I didn't really do anything that much different. I mean, I still, you know, knock the, you know, 12, the 12, the dark type thing, you know, one to dark, so like eight, nine hours on the doors. However, I, I did knock every day, Saturday, um, with the exception of, with the exception of, you know, maybe a couple of Saturdays out of the, out of the summer, I, you know, went home early and, you know, went hung out with the boys and the, and the team and stuff. But the other part of the equation though, was obviously, you know, you got to change, like you got to adapt, like you can't, you can't just expect bigger results and you know not change anything. And so I got, I actually changed my pitch quite a bit from my first two summers compared to my third. I, I didn't reinvent the wheel by any means. I still, you know, hammered and relied on like the basics of the pitch, but I, I did something that I like to call it kind of a pitch adaptation where my pitch would actually change. You know, I would adapt my pitch depending on where I knocked. I mean, it was, it's interesting. It's kind of like what we call, I know like, like the hot buttons, like have you ever heard of like the hot buttons metaphor, like in the, in the pest pitch, like you try to find out what the hot buttons are in the neighborhood and usually, and usually general rule of thumb, every neighborhood is the same. Every neighborhood will typically the hot buttons are the same. People, yeah. All the ter- the termites, the ants, yeah. the spiders, you know, the, it, one ha- it's for me, it's the roaches, right? So yeah, everyone has the roaches in one neighborhood. Correct. Yeah, exactly. And so I found that that same thing, not always, but I kind of found that, that same thing would happen with objections and also kind of like, yeah, just objections and like just preconceived conceptions that people have with pest control. Like I feel like after I talked to a couple of people, I could tell, okay, do these people have bug problems? If they do, um, do, are they switch over or are they, are they mainly switch over or are they mainly DIYers? And then depending on what the majority were, I would tailor my pitch to that. Or, you know, if it was a new build construction, okay, so people are new build construction. Um, do these people know what pest control is? Cause it might've been from like a, a Northern state for the Northern state where they don't know what it is. Could be a new a first time home buyer and they live in an apartment and they're maybe the, the apartment complex is doing it. Um, and so, yeah, I determine, you know, do these people know what pest control is? Do they see any bugs? Do I need to, you know, sell them on the fact that it's preventative? Do I need to sell them on the fact that, you know, it's going to fix the bug problems they have? Um, or, you know, vice versa, you know, I'd run into neighborhoods where people would have two companies, you know, they'd have a pest control company for the, for the yard and then have another one for, you know, like a, a mosquito service. And at my company, we could offer pests and mosquitoes. So now I knew that I could kind of tailor my pitch into, into kind of hitting on the sweet spots. Like, Hey, look, like I, most people already have a general pest control company, but then they also have a company for like mosquito service, you know, who do you guys use? And then I could kind of use that to be like, yeah, well, what we do is we kind of just consolidate those two services into one company under one roof. So that way we can, you know, knock down that, those monthly payments for you. And then also you don't have to be coordinating and, and scheduling with two separate companies. So that was a big part of it too, pitch adaptation and kind of tailoring my pitch to where I was at. And then also it was, it was just, it was, it was a big mindset shift too. Um, mindset was, a was, a, was a big thing. I mean, I'm a firm believer that in this space, I mean, I, I do believe that, you know, your pitch, having a dialed pitch, you know, having work ethic is a big part of it. But I also do believe a big part of, you know, door to door is just being confident, being confident. And then also just, it's just a, a huge, a huge mindset thing as well, believing in yourself and, and believing that you're able to do it and, you know, being able to execute on those things confidently. And another thing that was a big contributing factor too, was also upping my, my contract value. And in other words, just simply asking for more money from, from people. And I know that's a, from what I've seen in this industry, and like, especially cause I knocked in Dallas, Texas for the majority of the summer. And you know, these neighborhoods where, you know, come middle of the summer when every neighborhood's been knocked, you know, several times and they've talked to a couple of pest control guys. I noticed that everybody was selling on, there was price gouging, you know, like 
just trying to undercut the the previous company, you know, trying to beat it by five bucks. Race 10 bucks. to the race to the bottom. Exactly. Yeah. And I just felt like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna hit a, I want to hit a golden door sooner than rather than later. In order to do that, I need revenue, not sold accounts. Because I, I, for me, it wasn't about sold accounts. So when I set out to get a golden door, no, it was all about revenue. I didn't even look at the sold accounts. Like that's all I was focused on. And prior to that, my focus was, you know, sold accounts. But that this past summer, it was that was thrown out the window. It was just all about revenue, and I just knew that that wasn't how I was going to get there. I wasn't going to get there by undercutting people. So I also, you know, adapted to being able to just simply up my CV and ask for more money from people, and just master that technique. And I would say overall, I mean, those are the, and also having a strong why too. I mean, prior, like I felt like there for a little bit in my life, I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. You know, I was kind of, my original plan was, you know, all in in college. And then I was just going to do summer sales in the summer to, you know, pay for my college and not have to work while I'm going to school. And so for that reason, I didn't really, I don't really feel like I had a strong why, you know, so kind of, and I was even unsure what what I wanted to major in. Um, I just did generals. And then I finally, you know, decided to major in econ and finance just because I was like, well, it's a good business fill. Let's do that. I don't really know what else to do type thing. And then, um, I don't know. I felt like I just, I just really kind of figured out what I wanted to do, you know, with my life. I saw the opportunity in door to door. Um, and I also, you know, really wanted to, you know, achieve certain lifestyles, you know, lifestyle freedom, you know, financial freedom. And I knew the door to door was a good way to do that. And yeah, I just had that strong why in the back of my head. And I, and I saw that, you know, me getting a golden door, you know, hitting these big numbers and, and, and achieving that kind of milestone, you know, the, the top 0.1%, 0.1% in the, in the industry achieve. I just knew that that, that was always in the back of my mind playing. And just having a strong why as, as well thrown in there with everything else. Right on. So practically speaking, did you knock like two, three more months than you did the prior year? Or was it about the same time? It was about the same time. It was like two weeks longer. Yeah. Yeah. Two, yeah. Two, three weeks longer than a typical summer. And what's, what are you typically doing in a week? Revenue wise? Anywhere between. Uh, How many deals? Yeah. So rev, yeah, anywhere between, you know, 30 to, to 40 K in revenue, which is anywhere between like 50, 60, 70 cells, just determined, determined by the CV, depending on the CV. So the, so, so in retrospect, if you were to boil it down, you're talking about a difference of 150 deals. So you're, you're, that 150 deals for three weeks longer is not doubling your sales. So obviously you got better. Nope. Um, I want to understand, I want to understand more and I appreciate you sharing that. I want to stand, I want to understand more um, because obviously if you go from, I mean, something happened, right? Like something happened with you, you know, from the prior year to, to the next year, um, you know, maybe you kicked off your rookie, your rookie pants and put on, you know, <laughs> your, your vet pants or so, some, something happened, right? So I want to know about this pitch adaptation thing. So let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. Explain to me what you adapted in your pitch and how you did that exactly. Yeah. So in the pest control industry, I feel like everybody, everybody says the same, you know, standard pitch, you know, Hey, my name's so-and-so I'm out here with, you know, this company It's mainly for the spiders and the ants. You know, we take care of, you know, your neighbor, you know, Becky Johnson over here. We take care of, you know, Zig Ziglar, X, Y, Z um, truck's going to be here. It's going to be super cheap. You know, that's kind of the pitch they go into. Right. And, I was knocking and that was my pitch. I'll be honest. That was my pitch. My first summer, my rookie summer and my second summer. Okay. However, I, I was selling in Dallas, which was the most, which in my opinion is one of the most saturated competitive markets for pest control, whether it's door to door or it's just even traditional companies, local companies in the area, or even the big companies like, you know, Terminex and Orkin. And so I knew, and I remember that I was listening to, I think it was one of Sam Taggart's videos that I ran into on like Instagram. And he was talking about how, how the key, a big key in like door to door is, is being different. Like you want to, you want to, you want to be different than, than everybody else. And like, just step, yeah. like set out from, you know, stand out and um, kind of throwing people, people off. And so I knew that going into it, I knew that people were, were used to the idea of pest control. They were used to guys come by knocking on their door. And so, and they were used to them saying generally the same things. I knew that everybody was probably doing the whole, yeah, it's bugs. It's cheap you know, just the standard pitch. And so I knew that if I wanted to be different, I needed to adapt my pitch. And something else that I, when I say adapt my pitch, I also did a lot of some, something called more of like a, like a pre-overcoming objections. 
and also like something that I call, it's like kind of my own little thing. I call it like, like a tee up, you know, like when you're golfing, um, you know, if you try to drive a, a golf ball off the grass without a tee under it, it's, it's a lot, you can hit it off the ground. Don't get me wrong, but it's a lot easier if you get, if you tee that up, get that off the ground, you know, you have a nice clean swing. And so with this whole pitch adaptation, kind of go back to what I was saying earlier was just like we were talking about like the hot buttons, like each neighborhood, depending where you knocked, typically had the same bug issues. Not always, but probably 80% of the neighborhood would have the same thing. And it was funny. I kind of feel like I started realizing that like everywhere I knocked, it was it, not only was that prevalent with the bugs that they were seeing, but it was prevalent with whether they had a company or they were DIYers. Now, granted, there are like exceptions to that. Not everyone's going to be that fit that fit that mold. But overall, I mean, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. Most, I was in a neighborhood, usually everybody, if one or two or three people had a company that I was running into typically 80, 90% of the whole neighborhood had a company. Okay. And if these people were seeing bugs, if I had a couple houses that were seeing bugs, like if I first started knocking a neighborhood and everybody was seeing bugs, I knew that majority of the neighborhood was seeing bugs or on vice versa. If I was going to a neighborhood and everybody had company, but nobody was seeing bugs, you know, then I couldn't, I couldn't just go in there and just be like, yeah, it's, it's pest control. What kind of bugs do you see? Because then the odds of them switching are going to be a lot slimmer than none. The only time those people are going to switch is if they're, they're going to, they're going to want a cheaper deal, or maybe it's just because you did a really good job of getting the like you for some reason. Right. And so I knew that I needed to be able to, to maximize, you know, my time out there. And, um, I need to start selling people that weren't traditional buyers. So I learned that I could, I could pitch pest control in a way that I could, I could sell people just how I adapted my pitch. I could sell people that had bugs, didn't have bugs, had a company. It was a new build or it was a D or it was a DIYer. And so just depending on who I was talking to, my pitch would adapt and it would change to that. And I would just kind of throw in that, that T up step where I would typically, because it's, it's interesting. Like if you take every single customer, you know, a new star DIYer, switch over like they people typically say the, the the same thing like there's only a list of maybe 10 things these people are going to say yeah every once in a while someone will give you an objection or say something that's kind of out of the blue but overall it's the same thing you know i'm not interested it's too much i don't have any bugs um i don't feel like i need it um just you know the same stuff and so what i would do is i would start taking all of those typical objections that i would typically get from that specific customer and i would start kind of turning those all around in from negatives into positives that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So like for new homeowners, for, for example, so I actually would try to knock new build construction the best that I could. And then my first two summers, every time I would knock those neighborhoods, I hated, it. I hated knocking new build construction because most of the time they didn't have bugs. They didn't know if they needed it. You know, they had a lot going on and I didn't really know how to get around those objections because prior to that, I was selling people that, that, you know, actually like had bug issues. You know what I mean? And so once I kind of started doing this, I just, I feel like I just started selling at a whole new level in these new build, you know, construction homes, because what I would do is after I kind of get into my pitch, I would take all of those, those common objections they would give me and I would turn them right around into positives. And, and I just feel like it gave me a ton of power. It helped me maintain a lot, like made maintain control a lot better. And it was kind of like, I let, I took away all the reasons to say no. It's kind of like I was taking everything out of their everything out of their reason to say no. So at the end of the day, they're kind of like, well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense what he said. You know, I can't really just say no, like, you know, and people still would say no granted, but it just minimized the chances of them saying it. So yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, yeah, I get it. I get it. So tell me, tell me this. Did you ever use the, and this is something that I think I saw, I don't know. I, I might've saw it on TikTok or something, but it's like, yeah. So I know it's a, you know, New, new, new area, new build. Um, what's happening is since I've done 17 of your neighbors right here, like all the bugs are going to be coming this way now. So like, you know, I just don't want, you know, I don't, I want to let you know of that. Like if you want us to just continue the bugs to keep on moving down the street to the bad neighbor down the street, nobody likes that neighbor down the street. You guys don't like that neighbor too. Yeah, I know. Touch me on the neck. They with the loud cars. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's my brother actually. No, <laughs> I don't know. Do you ever use that? I just thought that was funny. Uh, some, I mean, I honestly never really did. Um, I mean, sometimes if I had, you know, I always had those weird people that were, would say something like, Oh, I like bugs. I never said anything like that, but there, there were these weird people that I run into that they, they said they liked bugs. Now I think most of the time, I mean, there's probably there's weird people out there that actually do like bugs in their house for some reason, but I think sometimes they were just saying, I just, cause they're trying to be facetious, you know, and just kind of get you off the door. But 
and they said something like that. But like, hey, man, no worries, man. Like, well, what we can do, man, is we can just go ahead and sign you up. We'll, we'll just service your, your two next door neighbor's house, and we'll just push the bugs your way. But that was more just like, I don't know, it's being funny. Yeah, if they're being facetious, <laughs> yeah, you go yeah, back. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> oh, you want to be funny now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I get it. I get it. All right. So, so really quickly here then, because um, I feel like we got somewhere with that, but I think I, m- I might have asked the wrong question. What I want to know is, 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 is what you're doing, what, what you did to change your pitch, was your pitch the same? You said, well, you know, you said you, you changed your pitch. So was your pitch the same in the, in the 500 year as it was in the thousand year? No, it was different. No, it was different. Okay. So tell me then, like, what happened to change your pitch and what did you do to practice and, and, and scale that? So what I did to change my pitch, so I just, I quit saying the whole, you know, my truck's going to be here. It's super cheap. In other words, I kind of left it more, I made it more of like a conversation instead of like a pitch where I, yeah, I had like a bare bone, like script of like what I would say, but it was more like a conversation. You know, it was more of like a, I would ask people questions that almost kind of like back them, back them into like a corner where they couldn't really like say no is easy. And so are you asking like specifically like what did I say to people or just like what exactly are you asking? Yeah, well well not 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 necessarily your exact pitch, but how how did you find okay, so that's a really good one. Like for instance, right there, like you stopped saying the hey, my trucks are right here now in the neighborhood, it's gonna be really cheap. Like how did you catch that? Who taught you that? So it was Parker. So Parker going into this year, he 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 knew he sold in Dallas and Houston, he's been in heavy switchover markets, and I don't know, I just and that's another thing that I think really contributed to my success was having a, a strong, you know, mentor, you know, in my, in my back pocket in my kind of circle that was to help me. Cause I mean, yep. if you look at like any greats out there, I mean, look at somebody like, you know, you Michael Jordan, you know, Chris Bumstead's a hot topic right now. You know, he's a, he's, you know, famous guy now, those guys all have coaches, but granted it's like, those guys are all really high performers. Even if they didn't have coaches, you know, they would still be, you know, really, really well rounded athletes, but they had a coach and that's exactly you know, what I had, even, even what I found too. So, you know, Dallin Green was also a really good coach as well. Um, when it came to like mindset and, you know, ex, you know, management skills and time management and stuff like that. But when it came to like the actual pitch, it was, it was Parker. I mean, every, he was the one that trained me my rookie year, my, you know, all the way up clear until my, just my third summer. And yeah, I mean, I just had a couple calls with him before I went in. I was like, Hey dude, you know, going for golden door, like, what do you, what do you suggest that I do? And he was like, yeah, I mean, um, he was like, yeah, change your pitch. You know, don't just be like, you know, my trucks here. It's, it's, it's super cheap. I mean, I would still say that, but I wouldn't just say it right at the beginning. I would, I wouldn't say that until I got into pricing at the end of the, at the end of the pitch, I would just tell him, you know, I'd still tell him like, yeah, we can get you guys done today. The trucks here, it's going to be a lot cheaper, but I wouldn't just lead with that. I led with, Hey, look, like everyone in the neighborhood, you know, is, is one is everyone in the neighborhood already has pest control. Like, this is what I would say instead. I would say, yeah, so everyone in the neighborhood, so I'd, you know, go through the name drops, you know, but yeah, you know, your neighbors just to build a credit building rapport. And then after that, I was like, yeah, so everybody in the neighborhood has pest control, but they've been, they've been upgrading from the pest control uh, over to us, which is called a hybrid service. Have you guys ever heard of that before? And so the word hybrid service, like, yeah, yeah it's, it's not, it's not, it's not a real thing. It's just a sales tactic just to come across as different. And then kind of what we did, what we just, what we established as the hybrid service was us just doing the extra service because Hawks actually, we actually did do a lot more service than most of these companies. Um, We would do, you know, the repellents and the eaves, you know, the wee poles, granules, spray. We did a fogger for mosquitoes. We even had termite this year. And so I would just use the word hybrid service as kind of like a buzzword just to, just so I look different, just because people are so used to guys coming by with pest control. And so I just would say, nah, we're doing some difference. It's called, it's called a hybrid service. And then I would always ask the customer, like, like, ask them, have you guys ever heard of that before? And you know, you, nine times out of 10, you're like, no, I haven't. What is it? And then I just keep it simple. I would say, yeah, so basically what it means is we're, we, we do everything pest control does. We just do a lot of the extra, you know, specialized stuff, you know, included standard in the service. And then I was, boom, just go right back into it, you know, figure out what company they have, go into the switch over, do discovery you know, kind of do some more eight miling. And then I would just explain our service and it's like, yeah, so the, the, the hybrid service is just all of the extra stuff that we're doing on top of it. If that makes sense. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. We call that like a, we call that the Confucius pitch. Yeah. 
So to, to break, to break you the, you know, either break preoccupation or what I like to say is your automatic response mechanism. Yeah. So like preoccupation would be like, you know, I guess in the beginning of the pitch, but then they have that, you know, they have that, that, that automatic response mechanism that they use for, Oh yeah. Is this pest control? Oh, is this roofing? Oh, is this solar? Or is this alarms? Yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah. Oh, is this Jesus? Yeah, no, I'm good. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it could be Jesus himself. They would, they would deny, right? Yeah. Definitely. Um, you know, so you changed that you changed up the pitch to make it more in with an, what's called the intrigue frame. So you use an intrigue frame where, where, where it got them to lean in again. And what, I, I guess at what point are you using that? And why, why isn't everybody using that? Is that like, what got, I mean, cause that's the difference between an extra, let's just say 700 conversations that you were able to convert 500 of those into sales that you probably use the same thing. And if you wouldn't have used the new, the new, you know, Hey, the hybrid system, if you wouldn't have used that, that, uh, that five extra additional 500 people accounts would not have listened to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause as soon as people hear pest control, especially in a, in a place like Dallas, you know, like Dallas, Texas, I just feel like their walls would go right back up. You know, no, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I've heard it a thousand times. I have a company like I'm good, you know? Yeah. And yeah. So. I sold, I sold in Dallas. Yeah. So I, I did, uh, I did, I did, I did two years in Dallas. Oh yeah. Yeah. How long solar. ago? So. Oh, it was solar. It wasn't pest control. It was 20, 20, no, 15, 16, 17. Okay. Yeah. A little bit ago. I was there. You said solar, right? Yep. Yeah. It's. It's yeah, probably, it's it was, probably uh, back a, when it was back in the solar city. Yeah, it's probably a lot different now. There was solar, a lot more saturation now. Nah, dude, I love saturation. I'd rather go. I'd rather. I'd rather go to the. I'd rather go to the market that people actually know what you're talking about. Than wait, yeah, solar. What? Wait, pest control. Wait, what? We we we. Who does that? They have to sell them on. I'd the rather. I I would rather because, yeah, because because I'm I'm the guy that does the same thing as you or did rather when I sold um, was, you know, the intrigue frame. Yeah, I know this is a hybrid system. It just doesn't work out for every house. I do a big pullback. So I, I teach and coach on the pullback pitch. So the pullbacks and takeaways, the same thing. It's like you throw the intrigue frame in there and then if you can take it away from them, you're like, yeah, sweet. So it's a hybrid system. You guys ever heard of that? No. Okay, cool. Yeah. I actually got to get going here in a second. I don't know how much time. Um, basically what it is is uh Boom, 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 boom. You know, yeah. it's all the traditional, what you get in your, your, your traditional service. You guys are with, um, Orkin. Oh, you're with, uh, I don't know, Apex or whatever. Okay, cool. Yeah, sweet. So a couple of the neighbors, same thing. They were with Apex. Um, reason why they were, they, re, reason why they switched over because, because of the hybrid deal, um, where you get everything you would get with Apex, your, your, your pest control guys right now. Um, but also then these additional ones, and it actually ends up being right around the same cost or whatever. I don't know. Do you end up coming and you ended up coming in more expensive than most of those other companies or what? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I was. That's one thing that I got that we had to figure out to do was tremendously upselling people. Yeah, yeah, tremendously. So here's the one thing. I, here's one thing I'll tell. Here's the one thing I'll tell you about Dallas. Dallas. Um, so I was in the number one office of the number one company. Okay. Oh wow. We were number one every single month. We were number one for mo most of the most of the months. Yeah. We got destroyed in Dallas because when you think of solar, what do you what do you think of the first thing they're selling? Solar. No, like, what do you think? What's their like big? I have it. What's their big selling point? Like, what's their selling point? Cheaper, no power bill. Cheaper power bill. Cheaper power bill, right? So, yeah. guess what? In Dallas, it was like seventy six people. Seventy six percent of the people were paying more for power. Really? Wow. So how how do you? Yeah, back then, how do you sell cheaper power when uh, we're not we're not cheaper? <laughs> so yeah, Dallas, uh, D Dallas made, uh, Dallas made us into real professional salesmen oh, yeah. and closers because we had to stop selling based off of features and benefits. Yep. It was a, it was a really challenging, a really challenging time in my career, but it was, dude, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I did the best I ever did. Now my, the company or the, the office average, I think it was like, it was like probably a, I think it was 11 deals or 10 or 10 point something deals is what our, our office average was. Bro, we we just destroyed it. Dudes were selling thirty deals. Wow, uh, twenty twenty thirty deals a month all the time. No, that's impressive. And that was a lot back back, yeah. back then when everybody hated Tesla. <laughs> yeah, that's a good analogy. So I I know how hard I know, I know how hard Dallas is. Dallas is yeah. very saturated, and that was the one thing they told us 
they're like, hey, just so you know, all the pest control companies are here right now. Yeah. We're like, all right. I never ran into one pest control guy. Really? I never never ran into one solar guy while I was there. No. Wow. Or a long guy. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Never. I might yeah. have been in the different different neighborhoods, but <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. Where there's a will, there's a way. Though that's the cool thing about sales is the, the the people who are willing to find a way will find a way. Oh yeah, dude, hundred percent. Okay, so you changed up your pitch. You you had more of an intrigue frame. Um, tell me, what I heard was talent is overrated. Um, you, you're talking about the mindset. Can you uh, can we touch on that for a second before I transition out of this? Um, this whole work work ethic thing with with our with our generation, you know, twenty and thirty year olds. Um, what's your opinion, man? Why 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 are uh, why is the millennials and Gen Ys or Gen Zs why why aren't why aren't why aren't why isn't there a work ethic anymore? What happened? Yeah, no, I love that you bring that up. That's actually something that I've noticed too, especially in like recruiting. I feel like a lot of these younger dudes that you're trying to recruit and you see it all over the place. I mean labor rates. I mean, there's even like data, like backing that, like labor, labor statistics show that labor, there's a labor shortage and like labor employment rates are, are dropping just because people don't want to work. And I don't know. I mean, the whole thing where it's like talent is overrated. I mean, I think that's like a two way street. It's like a yes. And it's like a no, in my opinion, because yes, there are people who are just naturally more talented, right. With, with sales, you know, with sports, you know, with, with really anything like talent is a real thing. Right. However, I, I do know I am a firm believer in, in hard, hard work. I think hard, hard work is, is a very vital, important part of the equation for success in anything. You know what I mean? I mean, probably there's granted, there's probably a couple dudes, you know, I know Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about it, you know, in his motivational speeches that, yeah, there's that guy that got lucky in the, in the gold rush, you know, but don't count on that. And I think the same thing today. Yeah. There's probably some people that got, you know, lucky with maybe crypto or, you know, something like that, but general of thumb, it's like, we live in a very competitive, competitive world. And I do believe that people who are talented, if they do not work and develop their skills, they can be outperformed by somebody who just simply has grit and character and does work for it. I I'm, I'm a firm believer of that. However, that's not to say that people who do have talent, if they work hard, then yeah, I mean, they, they have the sky's the limit. You know what I mean? With, with people like that. Um, and so, and that's kind of funny you bring that up too, because I honestly felt like so going into it, it's kind of funny. So, so when I when I went into sales, my first my first my rookie year, I actually was kind of hesitant. I was pretty, I mean, I was confident in myself. I knew that I that I had a really good work ethic. That's something that I always knew about myself. Is you know I played you know sports all through high school. Um, you know I you know was working full time, going to school full time. You know hitting the gym two hours a day. You know still getting good grades and you know doing all my work responsibilities and stuff, getting my homework done. You know still partying and you know having a social life. So I knew that I had a work ethic, but the thing was, is, is on the team, there was like 17 of us, my rookie year. And there was a lot of, there was a couple other guys out there that, you know, they were kind of the more, you know, they're really funny, you know, more like outspoken, you know, really extroverted, kind of goofy and just really, really, really good people, people, you know what I mean? And I feel like with me, I mean, I wouldn't consider myself, you know, super outgoing. I'm more, I'm naturally introverted. I'm kind of quiet. I like to keep to myself. You know, I, I feel like I have more like a, a monotone voice you know, compared to these guys, you know, who are just super, you know, just all over their, with their pitches, with their, with their tonalities and stuff. And I honestly didn't think that I would, I would do very well. My, my rookie year, I thought maybe I would just do average, but you know, we'll, we'll shoot for the stars and see what happens. And it was kind of funny. I don't know what happened, but I went out there and I actually ended up being rookie of the year, my rookie year and outperformed all these other guys that were, were supposed to be really good salesmen. They just had a natural act for it. You know, I went out, probably did, you know, triple, you know, what these guys did was rookie of the year in my company. And it was kind of funny. I actually got back from the summer, was talking to my parents and kind of telling them and they knew how well I did and stuff. And they actually told me that they didn't even, they didn't personally think that I would do that well either, you know, and it wasn't necessarily anything like, you know, not that they didn't think that I had the work ethic or anything. It was more just like my personality, just my personality is a little more extroverted and a little more quiet. But I think that's where I did exceed was, is that one, I had a really good coach, you know, Parker was a really good coach, you know, helping me in my rookie year as well. And also I think I just, the work ethic's got to be there. I mean, door to door is hard and I know, you know, everybody is, you know, it's, it's more like the work smarter, not harder, you know, mindset, you know, which is a real thing. I do believe in that, but at the same time, I think it's, it, it's good to work hard. I think when you work hard, it's, it's good to work hard. Um, 
it, 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 it teaches you, you know, you develop, I think you develop, you know, your character and, and you develop as a man a lot more when you're actually out there grinding and working hard for something compared as if it's just handed to, you or it's kind of like a come easy type of thing. And yeah, I mean, that's going back to what I said, just to wrap it up. I mean, I really do feel like there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other salesmen. Like I even had my company this year. Um, so even at Hawks, I was the number one sales rep this year at Hawks. Um, and personally, like, like, I'll just say it. Like, I personally do believe that there are a couple of guys there that are better salesmen than me. But I think where I was able to pull through and get the golden door, whereas they fell a little short, was just the work ethic. I just, just have that work ethic there to back everything up. I love that. No, I appreciate you sharing that. That's a, uh, that's really good insight there. Yeah. Um, where do you, where do you think, where do you think the big, is that the biggest differentiator between someone that hits golden door and someone that doesn't is just the work ethic. What, what do you think is stopping them from hitting it? I don't know. I think that's a really, I think it depends on the cell. I think it depends on the person overall. I think if you're just looking at kind of a broader, like just overall, I would same say market, person. same market, same mentors, same company, same turf. Yeah, I would say so. There's let's say both hoods are both hoods are equally, equally as ripe. I would say, yeah, I would say work ethic definitely would, would do it. I don't want you to answer what I want to hear. What do you think? Yeah, no, really. I think work ethic and, and your, and your mindset, two things. Mindset. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good. So let's, let's get, let's get out of work ethic. Let's talk about mindset then. Cause that's something that I, I know that other golden door award winners have talked about on this show. They've talked about mindset, how, dude, it's, you got to have a rock solid mindset, but the working up to get there, right? Your first summer, you probably didn't do 500 sales, right? You probably didn't do, I mean, obviously didn't do a thousand your first summer, right? Your yeah. mindset has shifted and it's grown. So tell me, walk me through the journey of your first year to your second, to your third. Now it's where your mindset's at and what needed to change. Like, bro, where was Cutler at? two and a half years ago, like I'm looking at a photo of you from 20, uh, what is this? You play the, you play the cross oh, football. I thought you were playing the cross over here playing football. Oh, never mind. This is 2019. Yeah, bro. So tell, tell me where, where, where was color at back here? 2019. You, your pops here. It looks like. Yeah. Uh, 2019, 2020. Yeah. What, what's up with these years right here? Where were you at? <laughs> I was in college Mental. still. I was in college just working, you know, nine to five dead end jobs. Favorite school. Cause my first summer was, was, was 2020. And so, yeah, I mean, back then, I mean, that was kind of, that was kind of my, everybody, I think everybody wants to be successful. I mean, naturally, I mean, everybody, you know, wants the nice cars, the house, you know, they want kind of that status symbol, but at the end of the day, not everybody has a work ethic to go out there and make it happen or the skill set to make it happen. And yeah, just to be frank, it's like, yeah, man, like when I was in college, it's like, you know, I got on for my mission, you know, I, you know, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be successful, you know, I want to have a nice life, nice home, nice cars. You know, I have a family, you know, just the, 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 the stereotypical thing that everybody says, you know, yeah, I wanted that. Um, and at, at the time I thought that was, that was the way to do it was college, you know, go to college, get straight A's, get a 4.0, get really good internships. Um, then you'll hopefully land a job, you know, making, you know, 70 plus K out of college, you know, and then you go and maybe get some graduate work done. You get an MBA degree or you go, you get a law degree and then you jump into a big boy, you know, corporate job. And, you know, hopefully you're, you're making around 150 K a year. And that's kind of like my definite, that's what I thought like success was. However, just because of the internet and just people that I knew and stuff, I feel like I quickly started seeing that it's like, Hey, like there's, there's more than one way to, to build a shit because I do know people that have gone to college and, you know, have gone that route and that are really successful, you know? And I personally, like I, I, I did really well in college. I was a, you know, straight A student. I was on the high honor roll every single, every single semester. Um, yeah, like college, I, I did, I did well in school and I just got to the point though, where I felt like I kind of started seeing that, you know, there's, there's more than one way to build a house. And not only is there more than one way to build a house, but one way might be a lot quicker than the other and a little bit less costly. You know what I mean? And so once I kind of started seeing that, you know, I, you know, I saw a lot of stuff on the internet, you know, YouTube, you know, Instagram, you know, I had friends that were talking about it. Um, yeah, even, even these big name guys, you know, like Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, like these guys were all kind of like, Hey, look, like college, you know, isn't the only way to success. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, even Robert Kiyosaki, you know, for example, all these big, you know, you know, 
popular guys, you know, were saying that. And I, and I, and I never really heard that or it was just a very foreign thing to me because, you know, all growing up, you know, it was, you know, school, 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 college, college, college. Right. And so, and I still had kind of like struggled with what I wanted to do for a little bit, but it, it was kind of funny. I actually just started out with a car, you know, like I remember like all these guys go out and do sales, you know, they come home and, you know, they get a cool, you know, BMW or the F-150 or the Tacoma. And I was just driving this old beat up, like 1998, like Pontiac Bonneville, like, like a, like it was, it was this ugly maroon color, this gross cloth interior. Like it was just, oh yeah, it was bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, man, like I really like, I'm grateful that I have a car, you know, it was free. You know, my, my parents gave it to my girlfriend on mission. So like, sure. Like I was grateful to have it, but I was like, nah, like this is not the move. Right. So that was kind of my original why I was like, yeah, I'm going to go out and do it. I'm going to make a lot of money. You know, I'm going to, you know, buy, you know, I'm going to get a cool, like, you know, I want a Ford Raptor, you know, that was, that was a cool truck, you know? So I was like, yeah, I'm going to go out and do it. I'm going to, you know, make enough money. I'm going to make enough money to get this cool truck. And then I'm going to pay for school and, you know, build a paper school for this year and have to work, you know, because before that I was working, going to school full time. And so, yeah, that was my original why. You know, and I, and I never like saw like door to door as like a, like a long-term play or even like a, like a bigger, a bigger, I never saw it as the bigger vision I do now, but, um, so I went out and did it, you know, rookie of the year, you know, made really good money. Um, got home. I, I didn't end up buying the truck. I didn't end up doing, I, I had the money to buy. That was the cool thing is I did have the money to buy it, but I decided not to, um, I decided just to save it. And then I looked into investing my money. So I was trying to be smart with my money. Um, just because I had a, you know, Dallin was a, you know, kind of a driving force behind it. He's like, no, man, like, be smart with your money, like, try to invest it type thing. So I was like, yeah, you're right, man. So I ended up buying the truck, even though I could have. Um, and then I just went back to school. Yeah, I went to school, you know, two semesters and went out the next summer. And and it was kind of the same mindset. It was like, yeah, I'm going to go out. And at this time, you know, now it was, the, it was the real estate. You know, everyone's trying to do real estate these days. And I mean, it's a good way to make a lot of money. So now it was, okay, cool. I still want the truck. Still want to make money by the truck. Still want to get into real estate, um, but I'm still going to go to college and, you know, take this traditional path. So, you know, I go out my second summer and, you know, I just went out and um, it was kind of a time in my life because when my second summer came around, I was like kind of struggling with some personal things, you know, and I actually was not even going to go out and sell. I was going to stay home and just go to school and just work. I just wasn't, I just wasn't in the best, like, you know, mind frame, you know, state of mind, I guess you could say. Um, it's like struggling like depression and stuff like that and some anxiety about, you know, some things. So I wasn't going to go out. Um, but you know, Dallin, you know, reached out, you know, we talked, you know, and Parker did too. And I don't know, I just came down to, yeah, like it probably would be better for me to go out and sell. So yeah, I just kind of, yeah, wiped the deer off my shoulder, got up and went out and sold and it's kind of the same thing, you know, um, same thing, just went out, I'm just going to go out and just sell and. I, I can be honest. I didn't really, I didn't really give it my all that summer. I didn't go to morning meeting. I kind of, I'll be honest. Like I had it established just cause I just, I didn't want to go to morning meetings just because I felt like there's a lot of rookies on the team. And I was like, nah, I, was, I guess I kind of had an ego chip my shoulders. Like, nah, I was rookie of the year. Like, I don't need to go to your, I don't need to go to morning meeting. You know, I'm going to spend my time, you know, in the gym, you know, cause it was something I like to do. So I go to the gym, I'd, I'd go knock and, you know, I'd probably get on the doors, maybe like, you know, one, two, you knock till dark, you know, and I was still performing really well. Um, I still, you know, and I, I didn't really knock all day Saturday or even half day Saturday. I'd literally just go out. I'd get like just two cells. And I just leave. And I could usually do that in like the first like hour or two. Um, and so I just to get two cells and I just go home, call it, call it good. And I was still able to finish number three in, in, in the whole company that year. So, I mean, it still was a, you know, beneficial summer for me. Um, and I still, you know, got back. I got back, enrolled in school, you know, back up there. I went to Utah State, you know, studying, you know, econ finance and still was kind of like unsure of like what I wanted to do, you know, I was still kind of torn and not, I still wasn't planning on doing, you know, door to door at the same time. But the mindset shift that, that came was, is I just, I don't know. I just was very blessed and privileged to see a lot of people in the space that I knew, like people at Hawks, people outside of Hawks, you know, I have friends that sell other industries, other companies and, I just saw what kind of lives these people were living. You know, I saw, you know, the, the, the cars they were driving, you know, I saw the houses they had, I saw the investments they were doing. And, and a lot of these people were like college dropouts and, and they were doing these big things. And I just, it just was, it just kind of dawned on me. I was like, well, I, obviously I feel like I'm, I'm very talented, you know, in this, in this space, I've done well and I've seen what other people can do. And, and then I knew it just kind of dawned on me. Like I knew what I wanted to do and long-term, what my long-term play was. And 
And I knew that if I wanted to, to do this and achieve that, and I wanted to scale, like, cause obviously the money isn't scaling. Right. And I knew that if I wanted to scale that I was like, if I want to scale, like I need to perform at a high level. So when I'm managing guys, when I'm recruiting guys, when I'm mentoring guys and leading guys, I can look them in the eyes and I can say, Hey dude, like, I'm not just telling you this because you know, it's like some Fugazi Fugazi stuff. You know what I mean? I'm not just, I'm not just recruiting you based off some sort of theory, you know, some sort of hypothetical that, yeah, dude, if you come sell with me, because I'll just say it, there's a lot of people out there that they recruit and no one's wrong with it. I mean, if you can recruit that way, that's great. I just didn't want to do it that way, but a lot of guys will recruit and they've never really thrown down or performed at a high level. And they recruit a lot. They recruit a lot off of, you know, you know what I mean? I mean, it's like I said, it's fine. I mean, everybody can, people can recruit that way. But for me, it was like, no, like I want, I want to kind of have that, just to say it, just like, no, I wanted to have that status. I wanted to have that, that reputation. I wanted to have that impact. Like, no, look, dude, like, like I've been there. I've done that. Like I performed at a high level. Like if I can do it, you know, I can, I can teach you to do it. And I was also looking at other people that had done in this space. And I, cause it was kind of funny. I remember Parker after my first summer, he would like joke with me. He'd say like, yeah, color, like you're uh, I'm committing you. I'm committing for you to, you're going to go do a thousand accounts. And at the time to me, like a thousand accounts was just like mind blowing. Like it was just like, just seemed like totally impossible type thing. Like, I, like there's no way, you know? And so once everything kind of just came together, I knew what I wanted to do. Um, knew what kind of lifestyle I wanted. I knew what kind of financial goals I wanted to achieve. Um, I knew that door to door was a, a, a really good way to get there and to get there quick. And cause I've seen other guys do it. And I just literally had the mindset that, Hey, if, if, if there's other people that are doing this, like, there's no reason that I can't do it. And then I kind of just like Kobe Bryant says, like, I kind of just like signed that contract with myself that I was going to get a golden door. So I could say that I've been there, done that. And there's no excuse, like no excuses. I love it. Let's talk about your goals. Um, tell me, you said you had some pretty clear goals. How did you make those goals? What were the, I mean, obviously your goals are adapting and evolving, but sure. Um, I, I, because you know, I'll give you an example. Um, I had I had a goal to get ten thousand dollars a month in passive income by the time I was thirty, and uh, I'm almost at I'm almost at thirty thousand dollars a month right now in passive income, and I I just hit thirty this year. So well, that's impressive. Obviously, your goals will your goals will change and have changed probably as as your mind continues to expand. But tell me how you got to some of your goals. Obviously, you've got the Raptor, which is probably the dopest truck out there. Yeah. And you've got the uh, the the C8, yep. Corvette C8. Tell me, tell me about. T- I know because you you've mentioned that a few times. So I want to talk about that because it seems like it's pretty important to you. And I want to know for the listeners, like like how you how you leveraged the click click when you look back at your truck or click click when you look you know uh, when you look back at your your vet. Like how does that? I want to ask you this first. How does that make you feel when you're walking into let's just say? Cafe Rio, Chipotle, Chick Fil A, Starbucks, whatever the gym, and you look back at your truck and you're like, or you look back at your C8. How does that make you feel, color? I mean, yeah, I just say it like it is. I mean, it makes you feel like a badass. Like, I mean, it it really does. I mean, I don't want to come across as like you know, like shallow or like superficial because you know, obviously, there's a lot more than just you know to life and having cool cars and cool trucks. But I mean, it's part of life. Like, you know, I mean, why not enjoy it while we're here? You know what I mean? And yeah, I mean it's it's a really rewarding. What's feeling. wrong with having a nice? What's having, what's what, what's wrong with having a nice car yeah. color? I don't. I, I, and and you'll hear me you'll hear me say this a lot if you watch through any of my stuff. But I don't care if you have things. I care if things have you. If that if that vet changed color to somebody different, then that's a problem. But if Cutler is cool in the vet, the same exact color that he was the day before he got the vet. If you're the same dude, then dude, we're good, bro. But if that if that vet changes who you are, it makes you feel like you're somebody different, and that you're not. Like I told you before, it's like, bro, we've got three faces. The one that the internet sees, the one that your family sees, and the one that you look at in the mirror. So how does it feel? Let me ask you the same question again. How does it feel when you walk away from the vet when you're, when you're heading to the gym? Yeah, it feels rewarding. It feels very rewarding. It feels fulfilling. It, it's, a, you know, it's a sign. It's, it's an outward reflection of like, you know, your work ethic and your inward ability to go out and you know, make, things, you know, make things happen in the world. And it's, I think it's true. I think, you know, when you, when you work hard for something, it, it, it holds a lot more weight and it, it, it feels you appreciate a lot more. In other words, compared to if you're just handed it, you know, and, and knowing that I went out and it's like, yeah, like everybody wants the Raptor, you know, the Corvette's sick. Everybody wants a cool, fast car. And the other day it's like, 
and not everybody has that. You know what I mean? And the fact knowing that I went out and I worked and I grinded and I made that happen, it's very rewarding. It's it's very fulfilling and good. It's yeah. yeah. Yeah, good. No, I, I wanted to make sure that we, we re, re went over that because I don't want you to feel ever, ever feel bad for um, reaping in the reward that you planted and, uh, you know, that you planted there, there, there should be, you should be unapologetic about, about reaching stuff like that because dude, it's just a, it's just a sign of your hard work and your yeah. work ethic. So yeah, true. There's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. I know you live in Utah. I'm born and raised in Vegas. I know it's very materialistic. We're basically mini LAs, but at the same time, you know, again, we, we, we have, we have to continue to obviously stay true to ourselves and then, you know, show, show the younger generation, the guys that are below us or guys that are around us like, dude, it's possible, bro. Yep. Like color, you know, you, you, you're, you're nothing really special, You but you just go out there and you work, you work at it. You, you've continued to work on your mindset. You've, you've got, you know, continue to learn how to be adaptable. You know, been around coaches, don't do what they say, right? Like you're not special. You just, you're just doing those things that these guys are telling you to do. And, and then you go out and put out the work. Yes, sir. Right. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. I love it. So tell me about, tell me about your, tell me about your goals. So what, what, what are some of the goals that you've hit that you've set and how did you get to those goals? Yeah. So obviously a goal that I set last year. So people ask me, <laughs> people actually asked me after the summer, they're like, so Kohler, did you, uh, did you plan on hitting a golden door or did it just kind of happen for you? And for me, it kind of caught me off guard a little bit. Cause I was kind of like, you're telling me there's people out there that are, that are hitting golden doors like by accident, you know, like, wow, that's, I'd like to meet these people, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like who are these people? Um, so yeah, last year, a goal that I set was to hit a golden door. So before I left for the summer, it was like back in, I think it started cultivating because I had never like a hundred percent committed to it, you know, my, after my second summer, but about this time, you know, January, yeah, about this time last year, that's kind of where they started like clicking for me and it kind of started figuring out, you know, just vision, you know, lifestyle, what I wanted. And so that's one goal that I set. A goal that I set is that when I get a golden door. Okay. And then number two is my dream car has always been a Corvette, right? Always, 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 always wanted a Corvette. <laughs> and it was, I wasn't ever like planning on actually buying one, but until like this right before the summer started, like getting one. Um, cause it was actually kind of funny. So my, my company that I, that I work for actually, actually pays for that, believe it or not. Let's go. Yeah. Let's so go. I had always wanted to, so it kind of just fell into place. So I set the goal to hit a golden door. Okay. I golden door. I want that. I want that status symbol. I want that reputation, in the industry, you know, I want to prove to people what I can do. Um, and also I'm just say, I'll just say it too. Like there were some naysayers in there. There were some people that were trying to recruit me from another company and they told me if I didn't get a golden door, you know, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't hit it unless you come with us type of thing. And I just, I just kind of, I just wanted to prove them wrong, you know? Um, so it was a combination of a couple of things. Mm. And so, and I remember I watched some, some YouTube motivational videos with Kobe Bryant and, and he had talked about, you know, like when he committed to something, he signed that contract with himself, you know, it was a done deal. Like it was happening, like, you know, come heaven or hell. And that's exactly what, what came to my mind. And that's exactly what I did. I set that goal to get the golden door. And then it's kind of funny, like right before the summer started, probably two, three weeks before I shipped out, my company came out with an incentive that whoever does 650 K in revenue gets like a, like a, it's on a car basically like paid for like, right. And so I was like, huh, well, that's exactly what I got to hit to get a golden door. So now that even just test right on there with the golden door and the quarterback, I was like, cool, it's a done deal. I'm going to, I'm going to go out and, and make it happen. And then the second part of your question was how did I make it happen? Or what was the second part? Yeah. Just like, um, like how did you come to those goals? Like what, what was the motivator behind them? So, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple motivators there for me. Um, I kind of hit on them before. I mean, there was financial motivators, you know, I knew the lifestyle that I wanted to live. I obviously wanted to hit, you know, certain financial goals. I want to be making X amount of money per year and getting a golden door because you get paid off revenue, not accounts. So servicing $650,000 in revenue, you know, and I knew, I knew what my commission was at the time, you know, I knew what kind of money that would look what like. What is that? Huh? What is that generally? Like the commission? When you sell six hundred fifty thousand dollars, yeah. When you sell six hundred fifty thousand dollars with the pest control, what do you get paid for that? 
I don't know. It just varies. It varies between your, uh, it very, there's a couple things that come into play, but generally speaking, I would say anybody, any company hitting a golden door is going to get paid anywhere between like 50 to like 65% off that. Just depending on how the, the, the of that. Yeah. Whoa. Damn. Yeah. So, and why don't you guys work all, why, why don't you guys work all year round? <laughs> I don't know. It's because in, in pest control, I feel like, just to be a lone gun and go out and sell a lot, yeah, you can make a lot of money. You can make multiple six figures, but that's like the top like one percent of the whole industry. You know what I mean? Like, I think the average guy in pest, I don't know what they make, but definitely like to make multiple six figures out, you got to be like you know pretty high up in the you know rankings when it comes to selling pest control. But where the big money at is is scaling and recruiting, right? Recruiting, kind of mimicking yourself, like replicating yourself, you know, wide and deep, and getting a lot of guys to go and sell for you, because now you can have better lifestyle. You don't have to go out and just be a hot gun and just pound indoors all day long. Yeah. You know, you don't have to stress over hitting these yeah, high yeah. numbers and it just kind of course yeah. in your lifestyle. So the reason we're not all year is because, you know, four months active selling and then the rest of the time we spend like more like building, you know, recruiting, you know, signing guys, stuff like that. Cool. Yeah. So tell me this and let me, let me transition really quick. Yeah. How do you define how, do, how does Cutler define success? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good, really good question. What is success? What is success to you? Success for me right now, just because I am, you know, I'm single, I don't have a family. I think success for me is just not, I hate to say it, but like just not, not living in the normal world, you know, not being, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, you know, not, you know, working a nine to five, you know, rat race job or, you know, working a job that I hate for me, success is having the finances to, you know, drive the cars that I want, you know, go to the places I want to go, buy the things that I want to buy within reason, you know, nothing, you know, I'm not trying to buy Bugattis or, you know, yachts or anything, obviously, you know, why not? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't have that kind of money yet. Maybe when I'm making, you know, 30 K passively, but <laughs> Just for, just, just, for, just for 30 K is nothing, bro. <laughs> that's still, that's still a good chunk of change, dude. Passively. Um, but yeah, driving the cars that I want to drive, going to places I want to go. Like, Hey, if I just want to pack up and say, yeah, Hey, me and the boys, let's go to Vegas, let's go to California, you know, let's go to, you know, Mexico. Like I want to have the freedom to do that. Um, you know, if, you know, buy the things I want to buy, you know, like if I want to go out to a steak dinner every night, or if I want to, you know, eat out every day or, you know, buy this, these shoes, these Jordans, these Nikes, whatever. It's like, yeah, like I want to have, you know, the, the finances to be able to buy that. And I also would like to, you know, be able to have time attached with that. So I'm obviously trying to build up my, you know, passive income portfolio, which is in the making. But I mean, if I'm working, you know, four or five months out of the year, making that kind of money and, you know, I'm still working, you know, the other eight months, but it's not as like hands-on, you know, it's like, you know, I have a ton of time. I can, because a big part of my success is being, you know, fit physically, you know, it's like, you know, our bodies, you know, are amazing, amazing things. They have this potential to, you know, achieve great things, you know, whether it's strength, whether, what are your fitness goals? Like if you just want to look good, you just want to be strong, be healthy, whatever. Like for me, it's like, yeah, it's like, I like to, you know, have time to go to the gym, you know, eat healthy, you know, and, and, and take care of myself that way. And also I'm a big believer in, you know, I'm a, you know, a Christian guy, you know, big believer in, you know, helping out in my community and, 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 you know, serving in, you know, my, you know, my church and stuff like that. And I have the time and flexibility to, to, to do that. You know what I mean? And, and that's another big part of success for me is, is having time and flexibility to be present in those, in those facets of life. And also, I mean, I feel like a lot of, I don't know. I feel like it's like a hard one to say, because I think a lot of people kind of like, will not judge you, but they kind of just think like, it's a, Oh, everybody says that, you know, but I can, you know, honestly say that it's like, I like to be that guy that has the resources to, you know, to help all my friends and my family, you know, like I like to, you know, feel like I have a big heart. Like I do like helping people, you know, it's like, yeah, sure. There's some selfish reasons in there. It's like why, you know, what I define as success, but I think success at the end of the day is like using, using those things as tools. You know what I mean? Being that guy to, you know, be there for people when they're, when they're struggling, you know, being able to, um, you know, have resources to help your friends and your family and, and, and help those in need and, you know, serve in your community at a, at a larger scale. And it takes, it takes, it takes money and, and it takes time to, to, to do that. It takes resources to, to do that on a large scale. And also, you know, it comes down to, I mean, it sounds like cliche and stereotypical, but it's like, yeah, like being a good person, you know, being honest, like being, you know, being 
being honest, you know, in this, in this space, in this door to door space, we all, we, there's always two sides of every story, but you know, we all hear, you know, that, you know, door to door has that stereotypical rap, you know, that, you know, it's people are trying to, you know, scam this person, scam that person. It's a pyramid scheme. You know, we've all, we've all heard those stupid gimmicks and stuff. And, but at the end of the day, it's like, Oh, I want, I want, all, I want all the pyramid schemes you can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> give me the, give me, give me, a, give me all the pyramid schemes. You want me to name them? No, I want to work for them all. I want all oh, of yeah. them. <laughs> no kidding. Right. I want, I want, I want, I, I, if, it, if it's not a pyramid scheme, I don't want to be in it. Exactly. Exactly. I can't stand when people, I can't stand, I can't, I can't stand when people talk like that about door to door sales. It's like, bro. Yeah. We've all heard. Yeah. First of all, do you, did you go to you, you, first of all, you went to college, you went to college and got a degree and you took business classes. You don't know what a business is, is a pyramid scheme. What are you talking about? Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. So we, we all hear that. You know what I mean? Hey, be, be, be. Before you keep going, let me let me let me summarize this while it's still hot off my brain. Go, 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 go. So success. Let me see if I can get it to you. So success to Cutler is being res, being a resourceful servant with the purchasing power to have the lifestyle that he wants to be able to travel to have to be able to travel and have the cars car to be able to travel when he wants and to be able to have the cars and resources that are that avoid, I don't know, I don't know how to end, land the plane here, I could stop there, to avoid the rat race, or, def, uh, uh, or not running from the rat race, but de defi uh, defying the rat race. Resourceful servant with the purchase power to have the lifestyle, to be able to have the cars and travel and friendships to live the lifestyle that you want. Yep. That's what I got. Yeah, in a nutshell, yeah. Go back and read, the, go, go, back and go, back, go back and listen to this and you'll want to write that yeah, down. Yeah, I don't have to, yeah. That was good. Oh, it was, yeah. Okay, so qu question. So that, good. I'm glad that's what success is. So tell me if uh, the reality is that, you know, you might not make it till 78. So how old are you now, Cutler? 26. So Cutler, if you only had one more summer and uh, trying to define your purpose here, what would you do with your time? That's a good. That's a deep question. I don't think I would sell personally. Welcome to the welcome, welcome to the welcome to the podcast. Yeah, honestly, if I knew that I had one more summer and after that, like my time was done, and I was done in door to door. Yeah, bro. I don't think I would knock, man. Yeah, what would you do? I think I. I don't think I would knock. I think I would try to influence as many people's lives as I could. Like you talking, like I was gonna die like next year or something. Like life was over or just like a dull yeah. door to door? Like life's over. No, life's over. Okay, that's, yeah, better. Okay, go. I was yeah, but you didn't, you, you, you didn't, you didn't, you uh, didn't, I don't want to, I don't want to say that you knew though. I want to say that you almost didn't know. I didn't know. I guess we can act like you did know first. Yeah, because the way you phrased the question, I was like, dang. Like, yeah, like, would you be happy with what you're doing? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, if I knew that, like, let's say like, boom, one year from now, like, like my life was over, like, that was it. That was the end. I don't. I don't even think I would knock doors. I think what I would do honestly is I would just, I would just spend all my time that I could just helping other people like achieve the same success that that that, that I've had. You know what I mean? Because like for me, it's like, you know, I was like depressed there for a while. Like I feel like I was just kind of down and like not a good place. You know, really struggling to like find my why, find my purpose. You know, I feel fulfilled. You know, and and yeah, like the success that I had in door to door, like really like pulled me out of that. It's opened a ton of doors for me, ton of relationships, like. Not even like a monetary scale, but like just like the relationships, the people that I've met, like the brothers that I've, the brotherhood that I've come to make with a lot of people. It's like those guys, look, those guys like my brothers that I sell with. Um, yeah, like I don't even think I'd go out and sell. I would literally go out and I would just try to help as many people as I could to to master the skill of of door to door, so that they could go out and they could they could do the same thing. Also, if I knew that it was that was it, man, I probably wouldn't even knock. I would I would I would even care to make money at that point, you know? Yeah. I love it. Oh, cool. Tell me about this lifestyle freedom. I've heard you say it a few times. So what, why, why is it, why is it that our generation wants this freedom so much? What, you know, before our grandparents, <laughs> parents, right? They're like, you know, the world war one, world war two veterans yeah. era, you know, they worked, you know, sun up, sun down. So what, why is, why is our generation? What, what is, and trust me, bro, I'm all about lifestyle freedom. Sure. Right, I, I live my life on purpose and designed like as 
as clear as it can be. Yeah. Why? What, what's up with what's up with this lifestyle freedom? Define that. Define lifestyle freedom for me. So lifestyle freedom. I mean, I think it's like going to be different. Like depending on who you talk to, some people are going to have different lifestyles that they're going to want to live. But I think general thumb lifestyle freedom is having passive money. Passive income is a huge thing that everybody wants. Lifestyle freedom. Yeah. So pa- defining it is pass like lifestyle freedom is yeah having passive income, not having to be tied down to a job, having time, money being able to afford nice things and, and travel and just do what you want in life, whatever that is for you, whatever you want to do. All right. So then let me ask you this then. let me counter that question. Then if money, if you had all the money in the world, right? Cause let's say you had your Bugatti. Yeah. Let's say you had the cars. Let's say you had all that stuff. Let's say you had the nice house and the jet and the yachts. Yeah. That's totally possible. Like uh, it's obviously possible. If you can hit a golden door, you can do all that stuff. What, what would you do with your time every day? I would serve my community. There you go. Being resourceful and being a servant again. Get back. Yeah. Such a good man. You are <laughs> do what I can. I love that. I love that. Give me a, give me a couple of examples. What do you mean by it? What, what are you passionate about? I mean, there's a lot of things I'm passionate about. I'm, like in what areas would you serve the community? I'm passionate about success. You know, I'm passionate about, you know, finances, you know, things of the world. I mean, we all are early on. Um, but I am passionate about being influential and, and, and being, being influential and being impactful. Um, one of my, one of my biggest idols in life is actually John Huntsman. You know, John Huntsman senior, uh, junior, senior. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah. yeah. So I've read, I'm reading one of his autobiographies right now, but it's just cool to see what somebody like him was capable of doing. It's like, he was a rags, riches, you know, billionaire guy. Right. And then. I, I read this crazy thing about him that he was, he was like one of 20 billionaires to which and granted there's not a ton of billionaires on planet earth, but there's still like a lot, there's a lot more than 20 billionaires. Right. But he was like one of 20 billionaires yeah. that had ever donated more than half of their net worth to like philanthropy and charity or something like that. And you look at what he's done, you know, he, he got the Huntsman cancer Institute up and off the ground. Um, yeah. He's involved in all these philanthropies, philanthropist um, endeavors and, he, he also served in, in his religion. Like he, he had private jets. He flew around, you know, the, his, his religious leaders, you know, for free on his private jets, you know, serving back in that way. Um, he was, you know, politics, you know, stuff like that. And he was a good family guy. Like just, he just all around a solid dude. And, and it took, and the only way that he was able to serve on that big of a scale was because of his financial and worldly success. And so that's something that I feel like I growing up, like I didn't really see, you know, like, now that my pa- my parents didn't really indoctrinate me in yearly which way with money other than just save your money, just go to school, go to work, save your money, and like you're fine type of thing. But there was people around me, who, brother. That's being indoctrinated. Yeah, I know it is. Yeah, like it, it is indoctrinated. Like you know, money's e- money's evil. Like money just causes problems. You know, like this and that. And it's like, sure, man. Like sure. I mean, some cases it maybe can. But if you look at it, if you want to like create like impact and like you know you want to whatever you want to do, whether it's a negative impact, a neutral impact, a positive impact. Well, not neutral, but a positive impact. It's going to take money. It's going to take resources to get there. And for me, it's like, I just, I don't know. I just have this natural, you know, I, I like to be that person that people come to. I like to be, have resources, you know, be capable of, you know, helping people. And, and we just live in a, I don't do. We just live in a crazy, we just live in a crazy world, man. And like, just it's that gap is getting bigger and bigger. I think with just, stress, people, anxiety, finances, inflation, like just everything is. And just to be that person, to be able to, you know, really help back. Like if I had all that and yeah, it's sort of my community. Just, you know, I think, I think politics is one way to do it. You know, I think if you're a big name in business or something like that, you can get into politics and you can actually really make, get the ball really moving big with, you know, your local community, your local government. And that can really be impactful. And you know, also in your church too, like, you know, a big, you know, you know, faith guy, you know, believe in hundred percent and it takes time and money to serve in, in, the, in those callings and, and, you know, and be impactful on a big scale like that. So that's another big, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah, I got yeah. you. I'm on it. I'm on yeah. it. Well, good, bro. Um, let me talk about some, uh, you said you wanted to be a real estate developer to, and to get into real estate. Um, I know you said it's cliche and it kind of is. It uh, is. It's funny. I'm actually here at the Mirage oh, cool. at a, uh, a real estate convention and uh, I'm uh, I'm doing some, uh, some networking here, right? So, um, 
it's definitely interesting. I get a lot of people that hit me up like, you know, Mikey, I want to get my first deal. I want to get my first real estate property. And I'm over here like, bro, t I'll, I'll, I'll give you my real estate properties. I don't even want these things anymore. I don't think you guys, I don't, I don't think you guys get it. I don't want, I don't want anything to do with real estate anymore. Real estate is such a pain in the neck. So tell me why real estate. I just, there's some guys that I work with close friends and close buddies that have a ton of passive income from it. And I have a lot of they? What do they own? Single families or multifamily? Multifamily. There you go. Yeah. Don't do single family, bro. Yeah. There's money in it. Don't get me wrong. I made, I've, I've got a lot of money right now coming in from single families, but dude, pain in the neck. Believe it. Um, don't go one, get, go like a hundred. So get into a syndication, get into a fund. Don't just do one and you're not the expert. Neither am I. So pay somebody that's an expert that knows what they're oh, doing. Oh, for sure. You feel? Oh, hundred percent. That is the, the you, you you run you run your lane. Let them run their lane. Yep. You know 100%. what I mean. So tell me why why real estate? What what? So it's is it it's it's because of proximity. So it's what you've seen. So it's what you've seen then, yeah. Yeah. Well, for right now. So for right now. So when I say real estate development, I mean like actually like. Let me give some background. So. Growing up, you know, always like, you know, always like construction, you know, thought tractors were cool, you know, digging the dirt with the shovel was fun, you know, building, you know, sandcastle, whatever. So that's what I did to pay my way through college. I worked in construction. I did like three different types of construction jobs. It's, it's hard work. You know, I enjoyed it. You know, it's fun getting out there, you know, building something, you know, taking a barren piece of land, boom, building something, you know, it's, just, it's very fulfilling, rewarding. It's just, I just, I just like it. I enjoy the process, you know? So I wanted to originally do, so that's where I was kind of torn. Still wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I was kind of like, yeah, I like construction, maybe I'll do construction management. But on the other hand, you know, I also really liked investing, right? And so, but I was, but then also I was thinking, well, maybe I'll just do, you know, I'll just do econ finance and go the investment round, do investment banking or, you know, just be a consultant or just something like that, right? Um, and then yep. kind of, it, it was all kind of around the same time when I was, when I kind of figured out and decided that I wanted to go get a golden door, I kind of just made the connections like well, why don't I do both like what's a good what's a good combination of the two and it kind of clicked with me like real estate development and so like I'm not talking about just going out and just buying a du bunch of duplexes and quadplexes right now I mean it's like yeah sure like if the numbers make sense like I'll do that um right now but the end goal is is once I'm done with door to door hopefully I'll have acquired you know enough networks you know capital um the know-how you know whatever the tool belt to do real estate development because I think it's, 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 it's a good hybrid of what I like to do. You know, I, I think it's cool to, you know, build something and be involved in the construction process, but it's also cool, you know, people are wealthy by investing their money in, in, in real estate development. So whether, it doesn't matter what you're developing, you know, so I think it'd be cool to, and yeah, it's, it's, it's obviously a lot easier said than done. And there's obviously a lot that I would need to learn, but right now my, you know, right now my, you know, my focus is on, you know, door to door right now and maximizing on this opportunity. Um, you know, and we'll, We'll figure that out, you know, we'll figure it out. We'll start getting our feet wet with it now, but you know, we'll figure that out at another time. There's always opportunity out there. Right. And so I think it'd be cool to, uh, you know, yeah, keep, 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 keep pushing, bro. Yeah. Keep pushing. Yeah. But I think it'd be cool to, that's what I would like to do. I think it'd be cool to, you know, get a bunch of money, whether it's my own, you know, investors, borrowed funds, you know, whoever's money, you know, go out, buy some land, you know, find a contractor, you know, start developing, you know, I don't know, develop whatever you want, develop a neighborhood, develop a townhome complex, apartments, you know, commercial properties, I don't know, a car wash, like just, just develop whatever you want. And then whatever you feel like the market or that place needs at that time, then you determine, okay, cool. Well, do I just rent these? Do I just rent these townhomes out? Do I sell these apartments? You know, do I sell this commercial building? Do I lease this commercial building? You know, and I just think it's a cool, it's a good combination of the two things that I want to do. And also I feel like will lead to a lot of lifestyle freedom, you know, financially, you know, if you're, have the capital and you're, you know, investing and developing your own properties and you're leasing them out. It's like, yeah, that's, I think that gets, that's going to be where I want to go in life. I love it. One thing you said there was OPM, other people's money. Yes. hundred percent agree. Yep. Yeah. Leveraging other people's money um, is definitely one of the fastest ways to, uh, to not only help them become wealthy, but also you become wealthy as well. Oh so yeah. hundred percent. I love that. Well, cool. So dude, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Um, any, uh, any final words for the, uh, for the golden door award winners out there? For the golden door winners out there? Nothing much other than to see you guys. At yeah. any, any words of, any, any, any words of advice? Keep going. Don't, uh, don't, uh, never be satisfied. Never, never feel like you've arrived. I know it's one thing that I start feeling is, oh, I got a golden door. I'm done. Like I can just chill out now. I think that's a, that's a terrible mindset to have. I think, you know, this is only the, Look at it, it's only the beginning, only the beginning. 
I love that. Other than that, it's awesome. Other than that, see you guys at well, JDCon. Cut. Let's go, Cutler. Where can we find you? Can we? Can I want, I want my people to be able to follow you? So where can where can we follow you at? What do you? Yeah, on? so I'm really active on Instagram. My name is just Cutler. My last name Webster. Cutler underscore Webster. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Yeah, I'll put all your uh, all your information in the show notes below. If you guys can go out and uh, follow follow our boy Cutler, show him some love. And uh, yeah, dude, really appreciate your time. Hope you have a great day, and uh, we'll see you at the Yeah, thanks, buddy. I appreciate. It. Thanks for having me on, man. It was an honor. Absolutely. All right, brother.